Hello and welcome everyone to webinar number six in our webinar series. And today we'll hear about the Porta Patch and its scientific applications. This is Cecilia Farre, Marketing Director at Nanyan Technologies in Munich speaking. And we're very happy that so many are attending today. And we look forward to the three exciting talks. So I'll move right on to the agenda. I would also like to welcome and thank today's speakers. First out today is uh, Professor Dr. Gerhard Thiel, who will show us the effect of X-ray irradiation on ion channels. After that, Professor Dr. Peter Ziegmund and Lavanya Moparty tell about their TRIP A1 um, experiments and lipid bilayer recordings on the Porta Patch. And the last, last talk will be given by Dr. Christian Grimm with backup from Dr. Christian Walschott, Dr. Sheng, Shang Shen, who will show us how to patch lysosomes on the Porta Patch. Then I will sum up briefly uh, before we start the Q&A session. Please remember that you can ask questions uh, at any time throughout the uh, webinar using the chat window. And remember to send all questions to all panelists so that the application scientists sitting here with me today can see the questions and answer. All questions will be answered either during the webinar or separately after. Briefly about Nanyan. Nanyan was founded in 2002, and with the introduction of the first planar patch clamp device, the Porta Patch, Nanyan has been profitable ever since, with the continuous growth of the product portfolio, but also as a company with a loyal and dedicated staff. The headcount today is over 80 people around the globe, from which 25 are postdoc level electro physiologists. The Porta Patch was launched in 2003 and it records from one cell at a time, basically replacing a conventional patch clamp rig, however with a drastically shortened, shortened learning curve and an experimental versatility uh, going beyond that of conventional patch clamp. The automated uh, platforms, the Patch Liner and the Synchro Patch 96, followed in the years after and were the first step toward patch clamp based high throughput screening. And then two years ago, uh, a patch clamp module uh, was developed, the Patch Engine, where up to two mod modules can be run at once, thus allowing allowing 768 recordings simultaneously and thereby reaching HTS standard for patch clamp based screening. And even though our main focus over the past years have been on automation and development towards industrial applications, I think we're still known for a highly versatile product and that we've stayed true to our organic, uh, to our scientific background which also is reflected in the increasing number of high rank publications coming from our customers around the globe, from which we today will hear three exciting talks. So Nanyan has developed a broad product portfolio over the years, not only in automated patch clamp, but also devices for automated bilayer formation and recordings, liposome formation, direct measurements of transporter protein activity, and measures on, measurements on beating cardiomyocyte networks. So the Porta Patch has been on the market for 12 years now with a proven track record of high success rates for completed recordings and a broad cell compatibility for cell lines, primary or even patient derived cells or org organelles such as lysosomes, which we will hear about more later. Porta patch add-ons are perfusion, ultra-fast perfusion down to 20 millisecond switch time. And a unique feature uh, is the continuous internal perfusion, allowing compound addition to the cytosolic side of the membrane. The Porta patch also has an add-on for temperature control. And since conventional amplifiers are used, 
One can, of course, do current clamp recordings. Here is a data example from stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. And as we'll see in Peter's and Lavania's talk, the PORTI can also be used for bilayer recordings using giant unilamellar vesicles and reconstituted ion channels. And I briefly just want to show you uh, the PORTI patch add-ons already mentioned are the perfusion systems and the temperature control. There's also a microscope slide allowing simultaneous patch clamp and upright microscopy measurements. The suction control pro is a computerized pump uh, for clamping the membrane at a defined pressure. And the low capacitance units for ultra low single channel, uh, ultra low noise single channel recordings. So using the port patch is easy, and I know that several of you attending today have seen it in action before, and for those of you uh, who haven't, um, this is basically how it goes. So uh, the NPC1 chip is uh, filled with internal solution mounted on the recording electrode. The Faraday ring is mounted. External solution is added, followed by cell suspension. The computerized uh, pump is started where a cell is caught automatically by applying suction. Giga seal and whole cell configuration is also obtained automatically. And then you're free to start your experiment. So the Porta patch is an enabling and versatile tool for high quality patch clamp recording applicable to most ion channels and cellular targets, even for organelles, as we'll see. It speeds up experiments, allowing up to 50 data points per day, and it's easy to use and learn even by non-experts. And it doesn't have to be such as exciting applications such as the port patch in space. We're always there for our customers, also when it comes to help with tricky assays or tweaking a particular protocol or getting the most out of your uh, laboratory work. The installed base of the Porta patch roughly corresponds to the number of parallel uh, recording channels in one synchro patch 768 patch engine, um, which is also reflected in the increasing number of high rank publications from the Porta patch. But what the patch engine does not have are the 700 and something very intelligent brains behind the porta patch, where at least three of them have taken electrophysiology beyond the possibilities of manual patch clamping. So I'm happy to hand over to uh, three of them now, telling us about the impact of X-ray radiation on ion channels hot and cold effects on trip A1, and how to uh, patch lysosomes. So um, I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Professor Dr. Gerhard Thiel from the Department of Biology and Membrane uh, Biophysics at the Technical University in Darmstadt, Germany. Over to you, Gerhard. Exotic, uh, um, ex uh, very exotic, exotic topic, which was probably exotic up to today. But today, uh, sort of, uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to people working on the effect of radiation on DNA. So the topic fits very well into sort of today's uh, events. Uh, the things I'm going to present are sort of mostly done by two students, uh, Bastian Roth and Christina Gippard and they were funded by the German government and the DFG. So uh, why... Gerhard, yeah? um, yes? have you shared your uh, desktop? I, I guess so. Okay, now, yes, I forgot to... Now something's happening. Uh, I'm sorry. All right. So you, okay. So now you Starting can... Again. Okay. Very good, so thanks. Thanks. Topic is uh, using the Potter patch for examining the effect of X-ray irradiation on ion channels. 
short summary again, done, work done by Bastian Roth and Christina Gippard, financed by the German government. And the question is why does somebody uh, examine the effect of X-ray on iron channels? Well, we are always exposed to ionizing radiation. May it be at home, uh, radon gas is uh, diversely present uh, everywhere. We take airplanes, which uh, expose us to ionizing radiation. We may have x-rays or computer tomography for, uh, for uh, diagnosis. We may eventually have uh, an x-ray uh, for um, a cancer treatment, or maybe in the future people may live on the, on the Mars or Moon. So you see a diverse possibility of being exposed to x-ray, to uh, ionizing radiation. And these radiation uh, exposures cause different uh, biological effects. So if, and already from the milligray uh, doses on, we can detect double strand breaks. For higher doses, we find chromosomal aberrations. And for even higher doses, we find apoptosis and necrosis uh, of cells. And this is basically the, the basis for the effect of uh, using uh, radiation in uh, tumor therapy. All of this has in the past been uh, explained by the effect of ionizing irradiation with DNA, and this is probably the most important effect. But it has been completely ignored until a couple of years ago that radiation has a high energy impact also alters parameters in the cytosol. It was investigated or was found that ionizing radiation causes changes in the cytosolic calcium, it's clear that also in the cytosol, there's a production of, uh, of radicals. And at the same time, independently of this, it was investigated or was found that an irradiation of cells causes an activation of potassium channels. This is a, a picture of an old publication from the 90s, where the uh, researchers found that uh, exposing uh, cells to gamma uh, irradiation causes an upregulation of a potassium channel. And this is right, uh, quite interesting since uh, for a couple of years ago, uh, people have been finding that uh, in upregulation of potassium channels, of particular potassium channels, can be involved in the generation of cancer. It can be involved in the modulation of apoptosis, and it's a key player in a cell migration. So it's very interesting in terms of understanding the effect of radiotherapy on human cells, what the impact on of radiation on cells is on low doses and high doses uh, irradiation. So our basic question was to follow up this initial publication, what is the effect of X-ray on cells and what is the effect of this uh, irradiation on, on channels in the plasma membrane of, uh, of the, the cells under the, under investigation. And there comes the Porter patch because I think all what we did was only possible with the Porter patch, because now we, you can see the Porter patch application in an upside down version. So we've been building a little plastic chamber uh, which we, uh, on which we put the Porter patch upside down directly on an X-ray source. So this allows us an online recording of the same cell before and after application of uh, X-ray stimulation. Before we did this, we were characterizing the cells, the cells that we used where uh, a human um, lung cancer cells, A459 cells, sort of a, a typical cell uh, type that is uh, used in, in many uh, studies also on, uh, on, on cancer therapy. And we find in usual protocols that the uh, current response can be divided in two kinetic components, a rapid activating current and a time dependent slow activating current. We found that uh, both of these um, currents um, are corresponding to do, uh, at least two different uh, types of channels and that they are carried by potassium. You see this in the D figure in which we were perfusing the inside of the cells with, uh, so exchanging the internal potassium with cesium and you see that the currents disappear. So we know that the main channels in, under the measuring conditions that we find are potassium channels We've also uh, characterized one of them or identified one of them, a very interesting one. It's this HIK channel, the human intermediate calcium activated potassium channel, also K calcium 3.1, another name. It's highly expressed in these cells. 
And the function of significance you can see in the next figures in which we were inhibiting the uh, channel with a specific blocker, DRAM38. So upper curve is the control, then adding DRAM38 and nanomolar concentration. You see that this uh, instantaneous activating current is basically vanishing. The time dependent, this KV type uh, channel that uh, we see in the cells, we were not able to really identify yet. It's not a KV 1.3 channel, it's not a KV 1.5, so we, we still don't know. But the most important thing is we know that the instantaneous activating channel is a um, HIK type potassium channel. So now comes the uh, important experiment. We measure the same cell uh, steadily on the porta patch upside down before irradiation and then we irradiate the cell for, with one gray x-ray and you see that uh, the, for, uh, in particular this instantaneous activating current is tremendously increasing. So we compare the IV curve on the right before irradiation, the white points, and then after irradiation, the, the field black points, you see a strong upregulation of the channel and you see also a left shift of the reversal potential. So saying that this uh, X-ray irradiation causes an activation of the channel and it's not like causing a hole because the um, reversal potential shifts left, which means it goes closer to the most, uh, reversal potential, it means we have an upregulation of a potassium channel. And we can now really look at the kinetics and that was something that has never been, been possible before. You see here three uh, different cells. So before irradiation, the arrow gives the time point of the irradiation with one gray x-ray. You see that within a couple of minutes with a latency of a few minutes, the currents increase after irradiation. So we have very fast uh, uh, look on the effect of radiation on these potassium channels. We can also be interested in the dose response curve and these small dose uh, effects here of uh, 100 centigrade or 50 centigrade, we only get because we are able to measure the same cell before and after. And so it's really like not a, comp a comparison of population of cells, but really the effect of a single cell on X-ray radiation. So we see that already a X-ray dose is of about one tray and it's about equivalent to what is used in, in cancer therapy for, for individual uh, sessions of uh, uh, exposure is sufficient to completely uh, uh, saturate this uh, effect. And we can also see that this uh, effect is really cell dependent and it's depending on whether the uh, respective cells are expressing this channel or not. On the top you see measurements with uh, h third cells or HIC cells which do not express the HIK channel and you see there's no there's no effect of uh, radiation on uh, on the channel current and you can also see this or appreciate this or the reason for this in the lower uh, graphs uh, B and C here we've been exposing uh, um, HIC cells to um, DRAM38 so the blocker of the HIK uh, channel and you see there's no difference so it means there's nothing to inhibit and there's also nothing to stimulate um, by X-ray irradiation. But if we then go and express the HIK channel in hex cells, on the left you see the gray line is before irradiation, the black line is uh, after irradiation. You see again an upregulation increase in the channel and a left shift of the reversal potential. So if cells are uh, expressing this uh, channel, they also show some effect of irradiation on their um, on their membrane conductance. So now we are at the situation that we can say, yes, uh, X-ray irradiation is causing already at low doses an effect on channel activity of a specific channel in the plasma membrane of cells which are uh, expressing this regulatory channel. Now we'd like to know what is the what is the signal construction uh, cascade which leads to this channel activation? And it has been proposed that uh, X-ray irradiation causes a an activation or causes the generation of uh, radicals in uh, cells which are exposed to this uh, stress. If we're measuring this or following this hypothesis with a uh, fluorescent marker, hyper, that's a radiometric. Um, protein which uh, changes um, fluorescence, uh, 
uh, in, as a consequence of uh, changes of H2O2, which is, le let's say, the, the last element in a, in a chain of, of radicals which are uh, short-lived. So the H2O2 is the longest-lived radical. And you see here um, a cell. The blue means uh, is a low um, uh, concentration of H2O2 in the uh, cell. And then we expose the cells on a specific microscope, which is directly linked to an X-ray source with 10-ray X-ray. And you see the, the blooming up of the cells, which means we have a rapid generation of um, H2O2 in these cells. So now we can do, again, with the Porter patch upside down on the X-ray source, the same experiment, and we, uh, we, uh, we um, expose the, the cells to one cray, uh, 10 cray X-rays, exactly like in the microscopic image. And you see that this is uh, causing a rapid activation again of an instantaneous activating channel. And we can block the channel which we activate by X-ray with uh, the specific uh, blocker. So this is now, again, a picture that X-ray high doses causes an upregulation of this uh, HIK channel. And now, that's why I'm showing the figure, we can compare the kinetics. We co compare the data from the uh, imaging, the black dots, with the uh, uh, increase in the, in the current uh, of this HIK channel as a function of uh, time. And you see that the squares, which are the kinetics or the increase of the current, they are very nicely follow the kinetics of the uh, H2O2 uh, increase in these cells, which means the channel activation is really a response, a secondary effect of a generation of radicals in cells which are exposed to X-rays. So now we've, we've uh, learned a lot. We, we know uh, X-ray is uh, causing radicals. We know, I am not showing the, the picture, we know that these radicals, as a secondary effect, they cause increase in calcium. And this increase in calcium is then activating this calcium-activated potassium channel. Now we have a sort of a nice tool in hand because now we know that we can block this channel with DRAM38. There's a, there's a number wrong, it should be 38. So now we can block the channel and see what is the effect of this block on the physiology of the cells. And now we've been doing uh, experiments in which we uh, uh, used the uh, conventional scratch assays. You sort of uh, have a lawn of cells, you produce a, a scratch, and you look under the microscope how fast the cells are able to uh, fill up this scratch, how fast they move and uh, divide to uh, sort of uh, heal uh, the scratch. We did this in the uh, presence of uh, the uh, TRAM uh, inhibitor, and we did this with cells which were exposed to one cray X-ray, which were not exposed to one, X, uh, one cray X-ray. And as a result, we find that the um, TRAM, for example, is inhibiting uh, the, um, the, the growth of, uh, of cells to fill the gap, and X-ray is uh, stimulating this, which means that the, the channel that we have identified, which is sensitive uh, to X-ray, is really involved or is an essential uh, component in cell uh, migration and cell proliferation. If we inhibit it with a, with a, uh, with a specific inhibitor, we find a reduction in, um, in uh, cell migration. And if we expose the cells to, to X-ray, we find that this uh, migration is stimulated. This is sort of at least indicating that it would be possible that this uh, cell or this uh, channel is a main component in cell invasiveness and cell um, migration, which could be a negative side effect of, um, of uh, cancer therapy, of uh, radiation therapy. So now this uh, could be my last slide now. Uh, we've identified a completely unknown uh, effect or pathway in cells which are exposed to ionizing radiation, causing uh, uh, H2O2, causing radicals, not only in the, in the nucleus, but also in the cytosol. As a secondary effect, an elevation of calcium, and this calcium is triggering 
at least in the cells that we've been looking at now, a calcium activated potassium channel. And this channel has some causal um, relation to uh, very important cellular processes like uh, induction of apoptosis, cell migration, and cancer. So I think with this, I've used up my time and I'm happy for your questions later. Thank you very much, Gerhard. It's a very interesting presentation indeed. And if you have questions, please type them in the chat window and um, they will be answered in the Q&A session later. So now we hand over to uh, Professor Dr. Peter Zygmunt and Lavanya Mopati in uh, Uh, at the Department of Clinical Chemistry and Pharmacology, Lund University, and Lavanya is doing her PhD work at the Department of Biochemistry and Structural Bio Biology, also at Lund University in Sweden. Over to you. Hello, this is Peter. And this is Lavanya. Yes. Uh, nice to take part in this session and to share our knowledge using the Porter Patch to understand uh, one of the key pain sensors discovered in the mammalians. Um, I'm a pharmacologist and uh, my great interest is of course to understand how um, natural compounds and drugs can affect our body and uh, uh, physiological events. And uh, you may all know about the trip channels it's a big family and here I will focus on the mammalian chip channels and actually the key finding which um, was that capsaicin uh, from chili pepper um, activated um, classical um, uh, ion channel with six transmembrane segments and um, it turned out that this channel is also sensitive to heat and um, this was done by David Julius and co-workers in San Francisco. I entered the trip channel research field in 1998 and our contribution was to discover that the body is actually producing endogenous chili pepper acting on trip D1. Um, following the line of uh, chemical interaction and uh, with proteins in the pain pathway, we continue to work with a number of chemical compounds from nature, some of them very irritating, <coughs> like from mustard and cinnamon, uh, cinnamon and also from garlic, but also compounds which are not known to be irritating at all. But using these compounds, we um, actually identified to get, together with David Julius, trip A1 as the chemo sensor in the pain pathway. Uh, just before our discovery, uh, a report was about trip A1 as a cold nauseous uh, sensor, nociceptor in the pain pathway. And uh, you can see this is a simplified view and now we can fill in with some other chip channels and other ion channels to cover temperatures from nauseous cold to nauseous heat and in between uh, channels which can feel and detect pleasant cold and pleasant warm sensations. So trip A1 is a clearly unique chemosensor. More than 100 compounds have been identified as trip A1 activators. Um, and that is quite unique. And uh, the literature is, um, <clears throat> does agree on trip A1 as the chemosensor. But we have to remember that when we talk about these trip channels as chemosensors and also temperature sensors, it could be that they are indirectly activated uh, downstream of other proteins in the cell, triggering the activation of these channels. But clearly they are strong candidates as chemosensors and thermosensors. So um, I think there is no uh, debate whether TP1 is a chemosensor or not in the literature or a candidate. However, as a cold sensor, there has been the debate ever since the uh, identification of trip A1 as a cold nausea sensor in the mouth sensor nervous system by uh, Pataputian 
and colleagues in 2003. In our paper in Nature 2004, we could not repeat uh, cold activation of the human TRPA1. And um, ever since then, it has been, been debated whether TRPA1 is a cold sensor or not in the mammalians. Nevertheless, um, there is uh, agreement that the TRPA1 autologues in the animal kingdom plays an important role in, especially in heat sensation. And um, in many, many different um, species, uh, TRPA1 has been identified as reacting to uh, moderate heat to extreme heat. And everything is to just to help the organism to accommodate to the environment. And um, also, um, it has been important for host seeking um, and avoidance behavior. Um, and regarding this, there is no um, uh, arguments at all. However, when it came, comes to the mammalians, um, I think that most people have uh, at least accepted that in mouse and rat, trip A1 can detect cold sensations. Whereas in humans, it's a big debate. And um, some people have concluded that it is a thermoneutral um, uh, sensor in the human system. However, even within the rat, uh, depending on the origin of the sensory neuron, there are neurons containing trip A1, which respond to cold and those not responding to cold, indicating that maybe there is something in the cell regulating the ability of chip A1 to respond to cold. And indeed, there is a very interesting mutation and gain of function mutation in humans um, suffering from um, episodic pain syndrome. Um, and um, expressing this chip A1 channel from these patients, it's obvious that they are even more sensitive to cold than the wild type and notably here in this case even the wild type could respond to cold but the mutant was even more sensitive to cold supporting that the human chip one is actually also a cold sensor so we were intrigued by this and uh, we decided to try to address two issues with regard to chip one chemo and thermal sensitivity and the first one was the question if human TP1 is an inherent cold sensitive protein. And um, because this cannot be studied in a cellular test system or, or maybe not even in the patch, because even in the patch, you might have an environment which indirectly can respond to cold and, um, and activate the channel. The second one was uh, um, that a lot of focus on the uh, chemical activation of TRPA1 and especially by uh, irritants like electrophilic compounds and reactive oxygen species is supposed to be on by activation on cysteine in the N terminal, which is about half of the protein. Uh, human TRPA1 contains about 28 cysteines and uh, they are highly reactive to electrophilic and also to oxidants. And the problem is that in the intact cell system, you cannot express um, um, these uh, chimeras or mutations or truncated proteins, which lack the N-terminal anchoring repeat domain. They will not be inserted or expressed or inserted into the cell membrane. So that is a clear limitation. So we decided to go for another approach and to purify human chip A1 and Lavanya will tell you a little bit about that. Okay, as, as Peter said that if we want to study the intrinsic property of the protein, so we need to purify the chip A1 protein. So we choose a PK expression system that is a very used here for the aquaporin group of proteins. So we express the protein in PKA pastures and then we used, uh, we prepared the membranes and then we used nickel affinity chromatography and then gel filtration chromatography to further purify the proteins. And uh, we did um, uh, two, uh, we studied the wild type trip A1 and we also did the truncation where we cut off the whole N terminal anchoring repeat domain. And then um, at that time, it, um, 
was not very clear to us how to study the function of uh, these purified proteins. And it was very timely with the um, launch of uh, the, the bilay recordings using the water patch by non-ion. And uh, so we um, used this technology to create um, uh, proteoliposomes um, uh, for the water patch um, uh, recording. And sometimes we also actually add the purified protein straight to a preformed bilayer um, for insertion. And we use both uh, techniques. Um, and this is our setup uh, with the porter patch and the perfusion. Uh, at that time, there was not the possibility to study um, cold temperatures. So we had to link up uh, or to use another um, equipment, which was a temperature control liquid cooling system and the using a perfusion system, uh, allowing us to go down to uh, 10 degrees Celsius. And here are some results, which uh, of course, if you're interested, you can look more and read more in detail in this paper. And uh, as we, what we could find is actually starting from room temperature, we, we don't have any activity of human triple one in its um, uh, native form. Uh, but going down to 10, we have an increasing activity of single channel openings. Uh, and the same when we cut off the end terminal for the truncated protein. And this indicates that, it, it, first of all, human TP1 is an inherent uh, cold sensor and it responds to cold temperatures, which is nauseous. And also you don't need the end terminal, which uh, people think regarding the thermal sensitivity of heat sensitive chip A1 channels, um, uh, that the end terminal is critical, but in this case, it's not critical for uh, thermal sensation. Um, we could also nicely block the single channel activity with a specific antagonist of human chip A1. And uh, I think this, well, uh, this is strong enough to show that the channel is, uh, is, is a cold activated by, but nevertheless, calculating Q10, we got quite high Q10 values indicating that this is a temperature dependent process. The next step, we were interested to see whether the electrophilic compounds, which are supposed to only attack certain systems in the end terminal anchor ring repeat domain, if they still could activate the channel outside the end terminal. And indeed, we used the mustard oil and cinnamaldehyde and NMM uh, to also activate the truncated protein, indicating that you can activate the channel by interacting with cysteines outside the end terminal. Um, it could once again be blocked by the um, 3A1 antagonist HCO3031. Uh, in our early studies, we in Nature 2004, we proposed that human 3 one is an ionotropic cannabinoid receptor. And of course, it's a little bit strange why this um, a protein which is supposed to sense irritating compounds also could recognize THC. And um, we were also interested to see whether this, this was a direct effect or an indirect effect. Um, but also this set of experiments I think is methodologically very interesting because here we use another cannabinoid acting on the CB1 receptor, very, very psychotropic compound, even more potent than cannabis cannabinoid um, uh, THC and more lipophilic and it does nothing whereas subsequent application of THC activates the a one So this also tells that this very lipophilic uh, compound uh, does not uh, activate the current by interacting with the lipid bilayer. So that was a very important control experiment. And then while cutting off this tail on uh, delta 9 te tetrahydrocannabinol, you lose the CB1 receptor activity. And in this derivative, we actually uh, could see that it activates chip A1, uh, both the full length and the truncated. And it's even more active actually than this compound. And it does not um, act on the CB1 receptor at all. Now, we were also interested, and um, since we concluded that the end terminal doesn't seem to be important for uh, cold sensitivity or even electrophilic activation of the uh, TP1. 
we still saw that the end terminus anchoring repeat domain must be important in some way. And then we were interested to see whether it could affect the voltage in a voltage dependent way and manner the human trip by one behavior. And in this case, we used menthol, which activates trip by one. And um, then we studied uh, the effect of menthol over many different test potentials and uh, both for the full length and also truncated protein to see if there was a difference between proteins with and without the end terminus. And um, as you can see that it is actually both on the, at the conductance level and also the open probability that are differences. So our conclusion is that the end terminus is not critical for activation of um, the protein by, by uh, chemical compounds, but it modifies in a voltage dependent way, the, the, the behavior. Now, when you want to study the, uh, the voltage dependence in this way, it's extremely important to know how the protein is oriented in the bilayer, of course. And um, in this case, we use derivatives of um, known activators of GP1. And in this case, we use um, um, a hydrophilic uh, derivative of an oxidant, MCA. And um, this is for the full length protein. And it, as you can see, when we put this compound in the internal solution, nothing happened at all. Uh, this is the outside of the protein. Whereas when we put it here in the bar solution, which is actually um, the inside of the protein um, uh, with all the cysteines, then MCR biotin could activate the protein. And Similarly, we used uh, NMN, which could be, we previously showed, could activate the truncated protein, and we used a biotin derivative as well. And once again, it could not activate the channel from outside, but only from the inside. So our conclusion was that um, the protein is preferably oriented in one way, with the inside of the protein uh, on top and, and easily accessible for compounds and, and uh, different uh, uh, temperatures as well. Um, of course, with the porter patch, you can only do one recording at once, and it's with the bilayers quite time consuming. Um, and also at that time, we could not um, cool down unless we use the perfusion system. Uh, but uh, we are very happy to see that uh, Nolayan has, has developed a new device which can speed up the recording and also has an internal temperature control system, both for cold and heat, and that is the Orbit Mini. And um, actually, um, some preliminary experiments performed by Nolayan shows that the human chip A1 is responding to um, cold, uh, uh, and it mimics or shows exactly the same pattern as with the porter patch. And um, this is from another recording where they have used uh, trip B1 and exposed to 45 uh, degrees Celsius, and it also activates trip B1. So that looks uh, very, very promising to speed up this sort of, of, of experiment. So our conclusion from these experiments is that yes, human trip one is intrinsically cold and chemosensitive, and it doesn't need end terminal anchoring repeat domain. And um, I think for future research um, in the chip channel research field, it is a um, uh, great focus on which part of the protein mediates the thermal sensitivity and also the chemosensitivity. And a lot of focus has been on the end terminal as having the uh, thermosensitive domains, um, but all these studies are relying on chimeras and muta, um, uh, mutagenesis, and we believe that that will change the configuration of the protein so much, so you will have indirect effects and you cannot draw any clear conclusions out of those, that type of studies. So with the porter patch and purifying proteins, we could cut off the end terminal and keep the rest of the protein intact. And um, we think it's a valuable complementary strategy to understand where the thermal sensitivity um, of chip channels is in the protein. And um, 
Yeah, we would like to thank you and uh, we would like to thank our funding resources, the Ethnos of the Swiss Research Council in Lund University and also the Research School in Pharmaceutical Science at Lund University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Lavanya. Very nice presentation. So now it's time for the final presentation today by Dr. Christian Krim and uh, Professor Dr. Christian Wal Schott and Dr. Cheng Shang Shen from the Department of Pharmacology at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. The uh, title of the talk is Lysosomal Cation Channels from Genes to Drug Targets. Over to you, Christian. All right, so hello everybody. Um, with me is uh, Cheng Chan Chen. Uh, Christian Wahl couldn't join today, but um, both of us are happy to take your questions later on. Now, um, so we're switching topics a little bit. Um, we are moving to uh, lysosomes that we have patched with the Porter patch system. And you see on the first slide um, that lysosomes are really small organelles, usually typically between 0.1 and 1 uh, micrometer in size. And uh, you can compare to the nucleus. Sorry, Christian. Sorry. You have to make a full screen. Sorry. Do you see the arrow there in the corner, uh, in the uh, upper right corner? Uh, there, exactly. Very good. Is that fine? Okay. All right. Um, so in, in relation to the nucleus or a, a whole cell, uh, the lysosome is very small. So we have to find tools to increase the size of the lysosome a little bit. And uh, you see this on the following slide. Um, sorry. Um, sorry. So I couldn't move to the next slide simply. Sorry, slide number two. All right, so you see this here on the on this panel on the left side. Um, we used vacuolin, a compound, uh, to increase the size of the lysosomes, and with this compound, we can uh, manage to um, increase the lysosome size up to five micrometer. And then we um, purify these lysosomes from the cells by different homogenization and centrifugation steps. And uh, then when we have this purified um, lysosomal um, fraction, we can use the Porter patch system to uh, perform uh, lysosomal patch clamp experiments. And you see this on the next slide now, moving forward to the next slide, sorry. Um, Here is the uh, trip channel family. So first of all, a few words about the, the uh, channels that we are interested in. So we are, we are remaining in the trip uh, channel family. We have heard about trip A1, uh, but we are focusing on these trip ML channels or mucolipins. There's three uh, channels in this family, actually, trip ML1, trip ML2, and trip ML3. And they are all sitting in the endolysosomal system. That means in either in endosomes or in lysosomes. And uh, these channels are um, interesting for or interesting for us because um, they are um, causing a disease called mucolipidosis type 4, um, in particular when we have mutations in the trip ML1 channel. And this disease is, uh, has an early onset. Uh, children affected by this disease show mental and psych psychomotor retardation. Um, they show retinal degeneration and corneal clouding. And they also show an endolysosomal accumulation of various macromolecules, lipids, and heavy metals. There's lots of different mutations known in patients um, uh, having mucolipidosis type 4. Um, you see this on this slide here on the upper left corner, you see the different uh, uh, mutations that are known in humans. Uh, point mutations in particular were of interest for us because here we thought we could treat these patients possibly with a lipophilic small molecule in contrast of course to mutations that cause a truncation of the protein where the pore of the protein would be missing. Of course in these cases we, wouldn't, we would not be able to interfere with the channel activity. 
The second uh, prerequisite uh, to do these experiments or to, do, to, to, to provide a treatment option for these patients would, would have been that the uh, mutated channel is still present in the lysosomes because some of them shown in green here show a strong mislocalization. They are, for example, mislocalized to the ER. Um, so they don't have the right location anymore, but three of those were isolated or uh, identified to still be present in the correct location. That means in lysosomes, we see this, see this uh, on the upper uh, right side. We, when we express these proteins, so from wild type on the left side to F408 uh, deletion mutant to F465L uh, mutant, they are still found in lysosomes, which are co-labeled with a lysa tracker, which is a marker for lysosomal structures. And then we can isolate lysosomes from these cells. You see the uh, magnification images uh, just in the middle row uh, for both uh, for, for, for wild type and the uh, actually two of these mutations that we subsequently analyzed with the Porter patch system. And we analyzed them or we, we looked at them with uh, two compounds, one of which would be the uh, putative endogenous ligand PIP2. Uh, uh, and you can see that the wild type is nicely activated with this putative endogenous ligand, while the uh, two mutant channels uh, have a significant loss of function. And when we apply a compound uh, that we found uh, identified as a small molecule activator of TRIPML1, TRIPML1 called SF22, you see that um, we can um, increase the channel activity of the two ML4 causing mutations here in the patients F465L and F408 deletion mutation by uh, um, a significant amount. So this compound is uh, we chose as a good candidate to be further uh, improved by chemical modifications. And that's what we did together with the pharmaceutical chemistry department. We modified this compound. You see this here on the slide. Um, the SF22 uh, uh, compound on the left side and on the right side, we uh, screened about 50 different modifications and identified a compound which showed improved uh, potency and efficacy. This compound we call MK683. And both compounds uh, were then uh, um, tested on uh, lysosomes that we isolated from fibroblasts that we got from these ML or from uh, particular ML4 patients. So we see a wild type uh, control on the left side in the middle row. Uh, we can activate the channel here with both compounds, uh, SF22 and MK683. Uh, a patient that has a complete loss of the protein, which would be trip ML1 uh, null or uh, knockout uh, variant, uh, has no, if the, here the, the compounds have no effect. But if you look, for example, if, at this F408 deletion mutant, this is the, where this particular amino acid is miss, missing, but otherwise the protein is still in frame and expressing correctly. Uh, we can see in these patient lys uh, fibroblast lysosomes that the compounds are eff effect effect effectively activating the channel. And even of, uh, with some of the um, uh, mutant isoforms that are mostly mislocalized, like for example, uh, mutation at position 446 or 403, we can still get some activation indicating that at least part of this um, uh, mutated protein would still reside in lysosomes. Now, the next topic uh, would relate to two poor channels. Two poor channels are uh, within the TRIP family, most closely related to the TRIP ML channels, both in terms of function, because they are also endolysosomal ion channels, but also in terms of sequence similarity. And what we did here is we, we um, generated a mouse model for uh, uh, TPC2 uh, by deleting part of the pore region, uh, which renders the channel uh, non-functional. And then we analyzed uh, this uh, knockout mouse by uh, different approaches. We performed Western blots with uh, antibodies. We looked at uh, immunocytochemistry. For example, you can see here on the left side, uh, uh, MEF cells, which are murine embryonic fibroblasts. When we use an antibody against TPC2, we get this punctuate pattern, which is lost in the knockout. Or when we look at liver sections, paraffin sections, then we can also see this punctuate pattern, which is uh, expression of TPC2 in lysosomes, which is then lost in the knockout. Now, importantly for us was, uh, and here we could again use the Porter patch system, 
uh, was to see that uh, with uh, putative endogenous ligands of this channel that we uh, would see a, a loss of uh, channel activity in the knockout to further establish um, the knockout phenotype of the, the uh, loss of TBC2 in these animals. So on the, on the right side, you see activation of um, the channel in lysosomes that we had isolated here in this case from these murine uh, embryonic fibroblasts. Uh, both uh, ex uh, experiments here show uh, the wild type fibroblasts activating on the top row with the PI35P2 compound, which can also activate two port channels, not only the triple ML channels. And another uh, more specific ligand uh, for two port channels, which is NADP. And when we uh, did the same uh, set of experiments with the uh, knockout fibroblasts, the lysosomes that we had isolated uh, from the knockout fibroblasts, we see a significant reduction uh, in the current um, in the uh, knockout uh, situation. Uh, in both cases, PIP2 activation or NAP activation, we had a significant uh, loss of activity pointing to uh, two port channel two being indeed knocked out in these animals. The remaining current is probably due to uh, TPC1 or maybe trip ML1, which are also expressed in lysosomes of fibroblasts. Now, the next slide uh, shows us um, a third topic that we have uh, been involved in. This is the role of two port channels in the Ebola virus infection, a very um, hot topic at the moment. Um, we had uh, the possibility here to uh, work in collaboration uh, with uh, in a laboratory in uh, Texas at the Bio Texas Biomedical Research Institute. They had found that um, Ebola virus is, um, or it's been known actually for a long time that these uh, phyloviruses where Ebola virus belongs to are traffic, being trafficked through the endolysosomal system. And uh, the uh, collaborators in Texas had found that a compound called tetrandrine, uh, which is uh, isolated from a plant called Stefania tetrandra, a Chinese medical herb, that this, uh, this compound has a positive effect um, in uh, animals that are infected with the Ebola virus. You see this in the upper left panel. Uh, so the relative infectivity rate was reduced uh, from 100% to down to about 25%. Uh, also, the survival rate was significantly uh, increased with this uh, after treatment with this compound. And also, the Ebola virus titer was significantly reduced uh, when applying this compound. Now, the question was, what is the molecular target of this compound? And since two port channels are uh, one of the interesting channels that are expressed in the endolysosomal system, um, we were contacted uh, by uh, this group in Texas to try to see if tetrandrine would have an effect, a blocking effect on two port channels. And again, we could make use here of the porter patch system. In this case, here you see a measurement uh, with, where we activated the channel, uh, TPC2 channel with NADP, and we can block. Uh, quite significantly um, this uh, NADP current with this compound tetrandrine. Now moving to the next slide, um, what did we learn from this experiment? Well, here um, we learned basically that two potents might help in the Ebola virus infection. By the way, this um, uh, nice arena here is the Bayern Munich arena. For those of you who are interested in the soccer games, Munich is famous for having a good soccer team. So TPC blockers might help in Ebola disease, and that brings me to this summary slide uh, where I would like to summarize the three findings that we had where we could make use uh, of the porter patch system. The first one was the um, uh, characterization of a TPC2 knockout mouse. Uh, there wasn't enough time to talk about the phenotype of this mouse, but this mouse has a hypercholesterinemia and fatty liver hepatitis phenotype. And of course, the porter patch system was very useful for us to make sure that uh, the two port channel is indeed knocked out in these animals. The second story was about uh, uh, mucolibidosis type 4 and the potential treatment. Uh, of certain patients uh, with of, of patients with certain mutations 
uh, in TRIPML1 and the development of a small molecule that could reactivate the loss of function of the channels in these patients. And the third story about the tetrandrine, where we could use make use of the uh, porta patch system, um, where we patched lysosomes uh, from uh, hex cells to demonstrate that um, NADP responses and also PIP responses, which are not shown here now, uh, uh, are blocked by the compound tetrandrine. Uh, I have a second summary which relates more to the. Um, uh, should tell you more about the advantages of the port patch system that we found uh, or the, what we considered a good advantages of the system. So the first thing is that um, the whole lysosome patches that we can perform with this system are more stable um, usually uh, compared to the manual patch uh, system or manual patch approach um, due to the solid matrix glass chips. Uh, glass chips and uh, the second uh, advantage would be that the system allows us to patch clamp lysosomes from uh, even from cells that are usually not growing on glass because this would be absolutely important when we do this in a manual situation, manual patch clamp situation, there we need to, uh, can only patch cells that stick on glass. Uh, but here we could also use um, or could also patch uh, uh, lysosomes um, from blood cells or certain types of cancer cells. Uh, third advantage would be that we have we can change buffer solutions uh, both on the luminal and cytoplasmic side. That's something that's not possible uh, in when we have a manual patch pipette. And uh, th the fourth point uh, is that we have no size bias uh, in the uh, porter patch system because we purify uh, lysosomes. We don't actually see what we are patching. That sounds like a disadvantage, but actually it's it's also an advantage because in the manual lysosomal patch clamp, we would tend to patch or we would only be able really to patch really large lysosomes up to uh, from uh, up to five to ten micrometers and, and of course these are highly artificial lysosomes and uh, in the porter patch we uh, believe that or we think that we are patching also much smaller lysosomes on average which also gives us then a smaller occurrence which is more similar to the uh, in vivo situation. Uh, yeah, in the remaining few seconds, I would like to thank, of course, our funding agencies. Uh, first and foremost, the German Research Foundation. Then we have also the Bavarian Research Foundation that funded our research, the Fritz Thyssen Foundation. And on the right side, you see all the people who contributed to these three works that I have presented to you today. And I'm now happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. And I apologize for the, uh, pr there was something, I couldn't sm switch in the f full screen mode. I couldn't switch to the next slide simply, sorry. Um, was it Was it still, s uh, sorry, hello? Uh, hello, um, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, w we could see your slides okay. uh, uh, very good, so. Um, no problem there. Um, once again, I want to thank all the speakers for the excellent talks. Thank you very much. Um, I think I've, we've all seen today that the Porta Patch is a powerful and versatile tool for patch clamp based uh, ion channel research with the potential of opening up completely new scientific avenues going way beyond the possibilities of conventional patch clamping. So um, actually we're a bit behind schedule um, and there's a couple of uh, questions. They will all be answered. Um, we can take one now for you, Christian, uh, again. Uh, it's about the lysosome uh, preparation and how that works. What is critical um, make, making suitable um, lysosome preparation as well as uh, patching? So what are the critical parameters? Okay, so one question that I'm seeing here is uh, what criteria do you use to distinguish lysosomes patched from other intracellular components? So, um, well, uh, you can mark the lysosomes with, um, for example, LAMP1 
to make sure that the membranes you're patching are really derived from um, late endosomes or lysosomes. In contrast, you can also, if you want to patch uh, more early endosomes uh, rather than late endosomes or lysosomes, you can uh, transfect, um, co-transfect cells with uh, RAP5, a marker for early endosomes. So by doing this, you can uh, sort of more differentiate uh, between the different uh, vesicular structures that you're patching. So you have to use markers for that. The second part of the question is an additional, uh, sorry, uh, the, how stable are the porta patch seals of license for durations and success frequencies? Well, perhaps I can hand over here to um, Chen, my colleague Cheng Chan Chen. He can possibly best answer your question. Uh, hello, I think the, the, the ratio of this have a successful seal, it depends on the purification, lysosome purification. And if you have good purification and the seal quality is also good, and you can have like 50%, but also depends on the yeah, different seal type. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Then there's a question for uh, Gerhard. Uh, what cell types uh, were used for the radiation experiments? Well, we used the um, human lung cancer cell line, uh, A549 cells. That was the, the basic cell line that we used. But we are <coughs> currently also using uh, lymphocytes, and we have been uh, trying, uh, and that would be a next goal uh, to do uh, glioblastoma cells because they are also expressing this channel and they are very interesting in terms of radiation-induced uh, cell migration. And then we've been using many cells which do not express or do not have a sort of a substantial uh, channel activity of this channel as control cells. Okay, thank you very much. And then there's a question uh, regarding the main differences between the Porta patch and the Orbit Mini. And I hand over to my colleague, uh, application scientist, uh, Mohamed Kreyer. Hi, hello. So the main difference between the Porta patch and uh, Orbit Mini is that the Porta patch can do uh, wall cell and cell attach, so with using uh, normal cell lines and also primary cells. And then we can also use tubes, so giant in lamellar vesicles that we can uh, patch on the porta patch. And the Orbit Mini is uh, using uh, pure lipids to make the bilayers and can use four, um, it, it does four ch uh, channels in parallel. So this is the main uh, difference. All right, and we'll just take one final uh, question. Uh, it's for uh, you, Peter and Lavanya. Um, how consistent is the production of the GOVs? Pick that one. Yeah, it's very consistent. Uh, so, I mean, all, all the batches are almost same. So it's okay. really consistent and helpful to make a GOV to then uh, other techniques. All right. Okay. Thank you very. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending, and also once again a big thank you to all uh, presenters today. It was a pleasure to hear about your scientific work. So then we say goodbye, and uh, we hope that you join our upcoming webinars as well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>